we have reached the appointed hour. Um, wherever you might be, thank you for joining. This is the dispatch working group for IETF 107. Uh, your chairs for this are Ben Campbell and myself. I'm Pat McManus. Uh, ben is here as well. So uh, this is going to be first for everybody. And as we like to say, if you're in the wrong room, go find the right room. But I guess that's just some other place to browse on the internet today. Um, but we have a jam-packed agenda, and thank you everyone for your you know forbearance as we figure out how we're going to do this over an audio conference call. So sort of the first rule of business here is uh, please make sure you're muted, uh, both your video and um, your audio, your microphone. And we're going to make sure when we do questions and comments on the presentations, we're going to make sure we take them um, all at the end because there isn't probably a great logistical way um, of interrupting things. Uh, we will talk a little bit about how we're going to manage the queue as we go on during this this introduction part. Okay, so um, the advice we've been given from the from the secretariat and from the ads, um, I do hear someone's background mic on. If you can make sure your mics are muted, that would be good. Um, the advice we've given from the ads is that we want to use the WebEx chat that is associated with this um, this audio call um, for the purpose of managing the queue only. So the usual back channel and discussion of what's going on. Uh, should remain in Jabber as usual, um, and we will have a Jabber relay um, doing that work, or of course, uh, you can just uh, cut out the middleman as it were and place yourself in the queue using the WebEx chat. We'll talk about that in just a second. Um, right, the blue sheets, always an important part. Um, conversation are on the etherpad. So I put the etherpad into the WebEx chat and it's also on the agenda. And so everyone who's in this call uh, really needs to load up that etherpad and go to the bottom of the etherpad and um, enable or uh, rather indicate that you're attending this meeting and your affiliations just as if you had a blue sheet in front of you. Um, the nice thing is now you don't have to pass it to the person next to you. Okay, so uh, thank you to some folks that uh, helped us ahead of time. Uh, Braun and Gene are taking minutes for our meeting and um, ESAM is gonna do the Jabber Relay and your service is appreciated. Let's see if I can advance slides too. All right, we talked a lot about a lot of this. We can talk about um, the WebEx chat and queue management meets if you haven't seen this yet and the one other meeting that has like, happened before us. If you go into the WebEx chat and you would like to say something, you may add plus Q, that's all you have to type. If you're in the queue and you decide you'd rather not to be in the queue, you can type minus Q. Uh, and Ben is keeping track of how this happens. Um, and Ben will actually just uh, speak into the audio to address people for them when it's their turn. That's how we hope to create uh, order out of uh, out of this broadcast chaos that we have available to us. Okay. Um, let's note well, we're used to in dispatch being the first meeting of the week. Um, so here we go does feel like the first meeting of the week, doesn't it? It's a reminder of sort of the IPR processes under which, you know, your activities uh, take place in all IETF activities, whether they be in-person meetings or on the meeting list or anything like that. Uh, before you speak is or write or contribute in any of those fashions, you should really understand what this means. And if you have any questions on that, please follow up with your chairs um, or the ADs, because uh, this actually is a combined dispatch and art area meeting and our ADs should also be in attendance. Okay. With that being said, this is the agenda we have in front of us for the next two hours. Um, the chairs and the ADs and the, um, the owners of the ASAP work or the automatic peering work uh, have sort of had a, a conversation and have an agenda batch of their own to suggest. Um, so the suggestion there is that we're very close to a potential charter already on the list. Um, and we think that the right thing to do here um, is to further refine that on the list um, for the ADs to consider a, a working group to come out of. Um, and the reason we think that is both because a lot of progress has already been made and this conference call is going to be a difficult forum to judge consensus on no matter what. So we're going to end up taking things um, to the list and we're not sure progress needs to be made. Um, but if there's any objections to that, um, I'm gonna open the floor now to hear those and uh, the authors are still prepared to give their uh, presentation and to have that discussion if people think that that would be useful. So I'll just sort of pause here. See if anyone wants to jump into the queue, you just do that in the WebEx chat. Perhaps we will get 15 minutes of our life back. Perhaps 
we'll just give it to as time allows material. We'll find out. Okay, so it sounds like that is okay. No objections were heard. Does anyone else have any other agenda bashes they would like to make? Well, it appears we have silence on that matter as well. Awesome. Reminder of the mailing list. So again, this is a joint meeting between the general art directorate um, and the dispatch working group. Um, and there are the lists and archives are available for both of those things. So we'll go through all those. And then when we're done, we'll talk about, um, or not when we're done, but when we transition between the groups, we'll talk a little bit about some of the buffs that are happening this week. So uh, with that, all that being said, um, looks like we got one person in the queue. Jonathan. Um, yeah, it's just one question. I, I'm not able to see anything I type into the Java room. And I was wondering if anybody it's working for anybody else. Sam, do you have something? E Sam, something you'd like to say, maybe? It's working for me. All right, maybe it's my client. I'll restart. Howard yeah. says it's plus one for him. So, yeah, hopefully a local issue. All right, with that being said, we will move on to the client ID work. And Warren is in queue. Are you breaking from Warren? So just a quick note on the Java stuff. If you're using ADM on a Mac running Catalina, uh, part of the issue is it doesn't like to scroll, so you might need to manually scroll down. And sorry for this being somewhat off topic. No worries. We are learning as we go along here. All right. So do we have a speaker? Do Michael available? Talk about this? Yeah. So, Our, how's the volume sound? You sound great. So just say next slide when you want me to hit the button. Thanks very much. Yeah, as uh, you know, um, we've been having some discussions on the mailing list and of course our prime concern is uh, we're looking at a home for our um, IETF drafts on the client ID technology, uh, sort of a two-factor change to both SMTP and IMAP protocols. But one of the things that uh, was evident over the last year is trying to find a home for, of course, uh, our client ID and where these discussions should be made. And a lot of the working groups did not encompass fully enough or was outside of their charter so uh, I expanded pre uh, before this meeting, we kind of expanded the conversation to discuss whether uh, the right vehicle for this would be going through dis uh, dispatch and talking about a new IETF working group that could address email security issues as a whole. And of course, that would make a great place and a home for our client ID technology. As we go through this, uh, uh, go through the slides. Uh, there is some opportunities for us to discuss uh, this, and um, uh, but I do want to just give a little bit of a quick overview. Most of the stuff, of course, is known to everybody, but email is still the number one used service on the internet. Uh, however, uh, one of the things I think anybody who's in this space is, is aware that the email compromises and the hacking attacks at email accounts has, has, is at an all-time high. Uh, also, uh, as you pointed out, uh, you know, the problem is that there is no current working group with a mandate wide enough to discuss uh, it in the general sense of email. Um, right now, of course, uh, some of the reasons that are complicating email security is data leaks have reached all time highs and a lot of the hackers have moved away from their standard spamming bots to using authentication botnets because the value in a compromised email account has never been bigger. Uh, and there's also in the, in the world today, we have a situation where still a large percentage of people are still using insecure protocols like POP and SMTP sending plain text authentication over uh, in clear text. Uh, this uh, is a huge risk to companies and a lot of both customers and ISPs either still are not conversant enough with this or they're not motivated enough to actually make sure that those insecure technologies are not being used. And especially when every coffee shop router seems to be hacked, anything in plain text is, it's not about, you know, if it's going to be compromised, it's when. Um, so what we want to uh, do is we should want to talk, uh, should these methods that allow such easy compromise, should they still be actually in the RFC drafts as a whole? Uh, 
or should we be starting to think about uh, things that were good for 20 years ago, uh, maybe that as, uh, you know, as the IETF, do we have some responsibilities to actually start saying that uh, pop over 110 plain text authentication should simply not be in our documents? And of course, we want to discuss the promoting of transparent methods of security, like our client ID drafts. Um, you know whether the you know whether the ITF has a role in uh, in helping or assisting in standardizing those things. Next slide, please. So I guess the first thing that has to happen is that the dispatch and everybody else we have to acknowledge the problem and when and of course we should be de developing a takeaway problem statement uh, in order to determine whether a working group is um, you know is the right approach to addressing these situations you know as we talk about uh, email compromises are more dangerous than ever and of course in light of all the things that are going around us we understand how important now email is becoming again um, however when an email account is compromised it's a lot more dangerous than it used to be nowadays the hackers are a lot more sophisticated they do everything from data exfiltration uh, steal your personal information all your contacts you know looking for they tend to own your mailbox for a lot longer before they even show any signs that they've compromised it. Gives them a lot of tools for, for instance, uh, you know, personalized uh, spear phishing, uh, the ability to, you know, impersonate somebody to another employee, of course, to pass on things like ransomware or, um, or getting the CEO to transfer their money. And of course, if they access your email, it allows, email is technically most people's second factor authentication for all their online services. So when you want to change a password for your banking information or even at network solutions, if you want to transfer a domain name, you know, you can do the password resets, you know, um, without the customer's knowledge quietly in, in the back. And of course, then there's the actual changing of existing emails that's possible as well. I think we all recognize the top three me methods of compromising email accounts right now. A lot of it is from data breaches where customers, you know, I mean, the average, the average ordinary user of email, frankly, they, they want to use their daughter's name and they want to use that their daughter's name as their password and every website they go to. They want an easy, uh, an easy authentication method to remember. They expect, of course, the data providers to be able to keep them secure. However, of course, when LinkedIn was hacked, and I'm sure that some of us are still seeing um, the hackers attempting to brute force using old leaked information. Uh, but there's also, of course, you know, the plain, the second one is the plain text transmission of credentials, sniffing. Uh, they compromise the IoT, uh, the router compromises. All of these have created an easy and simple way for the hackers to, uh, you know, to be able to find active email accounts that can easily be compromised. And, of course, brute force attacks, you know, the hackers that are attempting easy to guess passwords. In some cases, the botnets are so large that they actually can do some targeted brute force using all uh, data leaks of old passwords and simply adding the number one or the number two to the end of it. Next slide. So I think once after we've after we've done that, we have what we have to do is if we all agree that this is a serious enough problem that we should be looking at. Then we, of course, have to develop a mandate for the working group. And, you know, one of the things, uh, some of the suggestions that happened on the mailing list pre this conference is, you know, whether we should actually review some of the current RFCs that encourage or support or allow the use of the in insecure authentication and access uh, methods. We maybe need to look at other areas where RFCs and BCPs could be developed to help prevent email compromises and protect end users. And of course, one of our main goals is the, the ability to examine our client ID RFC drafts for suitability and standardization. Um, then, 
the other there's also other other considerations for maybe other transparent two-factor authentication that other people have thought out or that are easily adoptable by the community and transparent to the end user uh, maybe client id needs to be modified or there might have be some even some competing options and what are the other mandates I mean, and this is an opportunity for us to get feedback several members talked about you know would this potential email security working group would it address other issues like um, possible TLS, met uh, TLS methods? Maybe there's webmail security issues. Or how to even discuss the problems in the IoT botnets that are actually performing all of these uh, brute force attacks and whether, you know, something needs to be done about, uh, you know, uh, seeing if, we, if there's something to do about addressing the sources. I, of course, am trying to be humble and, and see that there's a lot more uh, intelligent people in this group that may have a lot of other ideas, and I'd like to sit there and get them as well. Uh, can we pass the next slide? Of course, one of the uh, obvious questions, why aren't the, any of the existing working groups uh, suitable for this? Well, a great example was our client ID RFC drafts. I mean, we filed these things already a couple of years ago, and we've been trying to find an existing working group. Uh, we just spent an awful lot of time discussing it, uh, you know, on various groups, uh, whether it was extra art. Some people were talking that maybe some security might have been because it, it didn't just cover SMTP. It didn't fit any of the groups that were handling IMAP. Uh, I think it's a larger uh, and more widespread. Uh, we need a more larger and widespread mandate you know, to handle these kind of discussions. Email rep represents a really, it's a, it's a, a larger set of services which are embodied with email. And when we talk about email security, I think we can uh, best serve the needs and, and the problems by addressing it as an overall uh, environment rather than just one simple protocol. And of course, uh, when you're talking about this, it requires different sets and skills and experience for the working group members who have experience with not just one protocol, but all aspects of email. Okay. And of course, simple uh, experience it would be helpful to have experience from other members of the community who are in, actually involved in real world uh, implementations and understand some of the impediments for quick adoption. Because if I mean, we can invent the greatest, most incredible technology, but if people aren't going to adopt it, I think we're doing a disservice to the community. So I'd like to have some discussions on this point. And, but if anybody else has any alternative suggestions on how to move our client ID or discuss these topics um, out or, or in, instead of a working group, uh, by all means, I would believe that's why we're here at the dispatch group. Next slide. Some talking points that I'd like. We've got uh, John Levine and then Ecker and Q. Sorry, I'll, I'll, wait till Michael, I'll, wait, I'll wait till Michael's done. Okay. Why don't we try and hold it all till the end? I think it'll just be easier given the format. Thank you. Sorry. I uh, was a quick two slides left. Uh, so, but. Uh, one of the uh, you know one of the reasons that we have all these problems, I guess, is a lot of times is without the mandate of the IETF RFCs, BCPs, ISPs have really no motivation to change. I'm sure we've all heard it from somebody who's the CEO says, you know, hey, I don't want to change the way we do things. I'm worried about that little grandmother up the hill who might quit our service. Or there are other people that say, well, the RFCs say that we can still do this, so there's no reason to change. Uh, and the number of ISPs that's still allowing it are just, you know, uh, are, do us a disservice. Email clients, if you take a look at the majority of email clients, they still will uh, give an option to, of course, connect to these uh, POP and IMAP and SMTP protocols, sending clear text. Uh, we need to have, send a clear message that the email client shouldn't be doing that anymore. Uh, customers, you know, of course, don't understand this and they don't want to change their behavior. We want to sit there and create technologies that don't require uh, the customers to change how everything they want. They don't want complex passwords, hardware, dongles, anything you make it really difficult for them to adopt, they simply won't use. But we as the, I, uh, you know, as members of the IETF and as vendors of, of uh, both email clients and email uh, servers, I think we have a, a fiduciary duty to 
do it for them. But without the support of RFCs, it sometimes makes it difficult for everybody to be on the same page. One, uh, one last slide. Next slide. Oh, sorry, I have two. Um, email, uh, one of the things is, uh, I'll post the actual drafts here, but I didn't think it was right to actually go into discussing the client ID drafts themselves uh, in fuller detail, but we can, of course, explore that if there's a, if there's um, interest from the group here. Um, I just wanted to point out that one of the reasons that we started off with this client ID, you know, is that uh, we simply, it's just not acceptable to send authentication over unencrypted, but we need it to be simple. So, so it's the technology that has to change. Modern day POP, or POP and uh, SMTP, these protocols, you know, they ha they were invented for a different world and we still haven't yet adapted to the current environment. The ability to limit access authentication attempts to individual devices transparently, the ability for a server administrator to be able to say, I guess just like in the old BlackBerry days where only this 100 devices can access my mail server. Um, several email clients, we've already have them supporting client ID. Uh, they were real quick to understand how um, being able to lock a mailbox uh, or to be able to you know, add this extra level of security is something that uh, needs to be simple, transparent, and of course, it goes to show how easy the implementation of our proposed draft are. Several other server vendors are interested in supporting it, uh, supporting it as well. But it does require a change to the actual protocol. So, what's the best forum or mechanism to move these drafts forward? And that's why I'm in front of the dispatch. Next slide. It's simple for us. I mean, I want everybody, even with legacy protocols, should be able to have that little notification that says, was this device attempting to connect your email box, was it you? It's simple, it's easy to do, and anything that we can do to encourage its use worldwide is something yeah. that we think is an opportunity for us all to maybe get behind. And I'm hoping to find a home to have discussions with my peers and my betters on how best to uh, get this. And thanks very much for your attention. Hopefully that's enough to start the conversation rolling. Okay, I'm in queue. Uh, uh, John Levine is either first or last, I'm not sure. John, you wanna go? I'll try and be quick, thanks. I agree with Michael that this is worth the working group. Um, I mean, we've already deprecated plain text authentication, but I, I think um, some BCPs for a, a BCP or two for mail, or for, just for mail end users. And I, I think making it clear we're talking about authentication of the end user. This is not server to server stuff. Um, on the other hand, um, I don't think much of the client ID thing is just another password to steal. And I think we could do some interesting work about like how you could do a you know time based one time based one-time password that the that the IMAP client could automatically send, um, so it, you know, so it's not it's not popping up a uh, a copy request every every time you check your mail or you know or six times a session, but it still would be something that would make things a lot more secure. So basically, yes to a working group, but no to this particular draft. Ecker. Yeah, I think I basically agree with John here. Um, I think it'd be fine to have a working group, um, but this mechanism seems uh, not amazing. Um, you know, when we decided to do 2FA for web, we decided to do it with, um, you know, digital signatures and, and tied to the connection as opposed to a bearer token, which is what this is. To the extent to which we're concerned about people using plain text, then this is, then the minute you send this token over plain text situation is no better than where it started. So, um, yeah, uh, it, I, I guess, I, I guess I, I'm provisionally in favor of working group, but I don't understand what the content of that working group is going to be because it's going to be this document that I'm less in favor. So, Michael, if you do want to respond to anyone, you can. Otherwise, I'll move the queue. Yeah, I'd like to respond really quick. The uh, first of all, of course, uh, you know, uh, thanks, John. We re respect you uh, an awful lot. But of course, if this is a working group for email security, it would be the right place to actually discuss it. I think we're a little early to sit there and uh, ixnay this particular draft until some discussions have been handled in a wider uh, segment. 
Uh, and second of all, for, uh, for the others, the client ID, I think we'll have to take some time yet to read the drafts because, of course, client ID isn't sent plain text. Uh, you know, it's a token that's done in the protocol level and it only gets sent over the encrypted layer. And it, and it can be used for several different reasons as well as being used as a token for two-factor. But I think that uh, we're a little premature to discuss this. I think we need to make a home for it before we discuss this. Ben, are we doing back and forth here or what? I'll give you back and forth. Sure. So either your theory is this data is encrypted or your theory is the data is not encrypted. If your theory is this data is people, if we're going to mandate encryption, then the passwords are actually pretty good. If we're going to mandate, if we're thinking people are not going to encrypt, then your token is the same problem. So I think you need to separate out what you think your what you think your solution does. Thank you. Again, like I said, uh, I'm, I should ask the dispatch group, but I did, you know, I didn't know if we were going to delve into the actual uh, into the drafts. Otherwise, I probably would have prepared more material. I thought we were first trying to discuss where the best place to have those discussions is as part of the dispatch. So, if you could give me sort of a point of order before I respond farther, uh, but have just to really quickly say uh yes it still goes over encrypted but the uh, but just because it's encrypted that's only one of the three main issues that are facing pro uh facing end users today i think we need a chair comment on that one this has been uh you want to take that patrick or should i well, I mean, I was just going to say, I think the reality lies a little bit in between these thoughts, right? You know, the, the purpose of dispatch is to take existing work and to try and find out what the next step for that is. And, and that does rely on looking at the specifics and sometimes refining that before you're able to form a working group around it. Um, and yet at the same time, we expect you know, that work to evolve once it's in a group and doesn't have to be in a final state. So um, it's certainly, I think, in scope to talk about the specifics of these drafts if the proposal is... Um, that these would form the basis of a working group. Um, but also remember that our determination sometimes is that the idea is a good idea and it just needs more refinement, right? So the idea is also you know, equally important, I would say. And does that mesh with what you were thinking? Yeah, I think it does. And I'll, I'll further say that uh, really at the end of the day, what dispatch needs to know is the problem is people want to work on and what the scope of that problem is, and where do we go from there? If, if where would we go from here involved a mini working group, something like that, then we would need to come up with a charter with a real scope for these. And maybe these drafts are input into that, and maybe they're not. Uh, so it's reasonable to think, of, to think about these drafts a little bit. It's probably not reasonable for right now for us to go into a huge bit of technical discussion about them. Uh, but but they're not off the table either. Yeah, I mean, the core question is, are the drafts fundamental to what is being discussed as a topic, right? So that's worth exploring. And I believe uh, that was one of the questions that I had earlier on uh, when we first uh, talked about this session at the dispatch was to, uh, when I was asking to the mailing list, how big and how wide should the scope as you can see, the total was email security. And I would think that there'd be several issues under email security that could be addressed. And one of the things, uh, as I said, our drafts, the two-factor authentication could be part of it. But again, we do have to uh, go back to you know, slide one and two, where we're simply asking, first of all, is this a problem important enough to address, which I think everybody has gotten behind it. But I think we have to now then go into steps two and three which determine right what whether we thank you uh is determining what is the problem statement that the working group is intending to solve and i'd like to suggest that the top three methods of compromising email accounts might be the right place to uh you know to take that now if that's not the if that's not what other people would see as um uh, the the working group's purpose um, then I'm, then I'd like to, you know, give up the floor and let you hear other people's ideas. So we have some more people in queue, so let's go ahead and, and hear what people have to say. Uh, I think I've got uh, Richard Barnes up next. Uh, hi, am I audible here? I think you have him out of order, Ben. 
sorry. I forgot Pete. I'm sorry. I can't imagine how I could ever forget Pete. And I think you have Seth uh, before Pete. Right. And you know, I actually have all this written down. So I'm just, it's just entirely me. I'm incompetent. Uh, but I have my notes are just fine. So I've got Seth next. Yes. I, thanks. Um, re really quick, I want to. I, I agree with what uh, John and Ecker were saying. I think the working group here makes sense. I, I'm concerned right now the conversation is still too broad, and I, I'm worried that that looking at the top three methods of compromised email accounts is also sort of the wrong lens here, because these aren't really where the, the protocols break down. They're not all in one place, and, and some of these are a tremendous amount of work to address. Um, I think I think this this requires a lot more discussion uh, on exactly where to focus. I, I also think the client ID draft is the wrong place to start. There are sort of two things that that jump out uh, about client ID in particular. The first one is that the the credential is just equally as forgeable as say an LO name, which is used for sort of the same mechanism. And, and the second one is that it's it feels like you need a prearranged relationship for the client they need to make sense and the, the, the whole point of everything we're doing in email series to get a prearranged relationships between senders and receivers so something seems very weird with this draft um and so all that said i think this is absolutely a place to spend time but i think it's got to be focused more than this is the method to here are a couple of really specific protocols. Here's one very specific problem uh, that we should tackle first. I'm not sure what that is right now, but I think that that's really uh, what I think Michael said is, is what we need to focus on. Um, thank you. Okay, now I think it's, uh, I actually have John Levine again, but I think he might be covered. So John, tell me if you need back in queue, otherwise it's Pete. Oh, so, uh, yeah, I just saw John Q minus. Uh, so uh, two things. First, I, I think one of the things you're hearing is that we sort of need a, a more focused problem statement rather than just two target protocols to go after. And I don't, I'm not suggesting you try and write a, a problem statement draft, but more of a couple of paragraphs that might be part of a charter and work with some of the folks who you're hearing from saying, yeah, this sounds like a good charterable working group, but not these things. Because I think if you drill down on the problem you're actually trying to solve here, you'll form a charter that either will get these documents into the working group or will have a good set of reasons for, yeah, these are the things we're looking for, but not these particular solutions. Um, the other, uh, thing I had, which is more of a question for Michael, and you do not have to answer this directly, um, but have you made any IPR statements on these two drafts? Will you be making them? Uh, uh, do you have any to make here? Yes. Uh, sorry, I should have muted while I was listening to you, but um, they, they actually, there are uh, some, we've already made some statements on that. Uh, for us, it's our goal to have the whole world adopting these uh, things. We think it's very simple uh, and having worked with several different vendors and several different email clients and helping them implement it quickly and easily. Uh, you know, it is something we want uh, you know, we've already contributed the code to several open source projects. It, it's meant for worldwide adoption. The only intellectual property we have around it is in some of our threat detection because we can tell based on patterns of, uh, of bad actors that are attempting to hack. It can, we have some ways to sit there and uh, add that to our own threat detection technologies, but that's uh, that's above and beyond the actual use. But we have referenced it in the uh, in the documents just to make sure that there's full transparency. And and given that you probably want to fill out the IPR disclosure uh, form on the website just so it has a back pointer to this. Sorry, I'll have to double check because I thought we already did, but thank you very much. Okay. Well, that's very good, thank you. We're actually back to Richard. All right, thanks for uh, circling around. 
Um, so yeah, it seems like uh, as Pete said, there's if we're, if a working group is going to be formed here, we would need to have an idea of what problem it's trying to solve. And I feel like there's two problems that came out from the presentation here. One is generally getting insecure stuff out of the email infrastructure, um, things like lack of encryption, things like um, unauthenticated um, aspects. And the other one is solving uh, phishing and account takeover. Um, well, solving account takeover email, and generally speaking, kind of two-factor or multi-factor for uh, email access. Um, now, one of those seems kind of doable. Um, uh, well, so the, the first, the, the kind of general, um, you know, better advice for, for you know, use of security features in email seems like something that we could definitely do. Like, I think people on this call probably have a pretty good idea of what's good and what's not. Um, with that bucket, I'm less, uh, it's less clear to me that anyone would pay attention to that. Like, it's been pretty clear for a long time what the good stuff and what the bad stuff is, and people still use the bad stuff. So on that bucket, like it's clearly achievable. Uh, it's not clear it would have much value in the end. Um, on the multi-factor point, I think there probably is some benefits to be had, um, but it's a little bit more of a science project. Um, these sort of standards projects um, often work best when there's some deployed art um, and it's been widely deployed in some contexts already. Um, the thing of Acme was, for example, was already deployed at some scale by Let's Encrypt by the time we got around to really publishing the RFCs. We had some idea that it would actually work. Um, so this is a bit more um, blue sky. Um, but even that said, it seems like, uh, as as Eric Scorlo was hinting, um, we should uh, borrow from the pretty extensive prior art in the web space um, where have many options have already been explored uh, from uh, one-time passwords to SMS and what have you. Uh, and people really have landed on these asymmetric crypto-based solutions uh, like FIDO and token binding. Um, and so if we're going to do some something that tries to address similar problems in the email space, we should lean heavily on the prior art there and do minimal new invention. That's all I got. Hey, thanks, Richard. Um, I do appreciate you sitting there realizing that the anything that was is going to help on the multi-factor is really, of course, the goal here. When we talk about it's uh, the plain text pass. Uh, sorry, when we talk about the plain text, that's one issue, and we'd like to see the ITF tackle that. For us personally, of course, we're more interested in things like the data breaches, the brute force attacks, the easy to guess passwords, where you're not going to get end users to do. Um, to change their behavior. However, if you have a server operator and an email client that both agree to slightly extend the protocols, and by, by the way, just so you're aware, you know, uh, we have a couple million people in North America that now have client ID access. They, uh, we have uh, just recently um, very large products like uh, Blue Mail, uh, Sanebox, um, uh, even uh, Thunderbird, and you know LibEpan, and so there is already uh, getting to be a bit of widespread uh, adoption of this little protocol because it's so simple and it does fix a pain. Many of the other prior art that you talk about have been around for quite some time, and they're not being adopted because they aren't as easy to implement which is our point that why we want to help promote this. I have Spencer next to you. Thank you. Uh, so I had two things. One uh, was to ask the question, uh, we're talking about a problem statement kind of thing, uh, whether that was just a couple paragraphs for a uh, charter or something else. Uh, doesn't matter. Uh, is that something that people think would converge in finite time? Fair question. Define people. People who would show up in a working group. <laughs> well, I believe that I'd, of course, volunteer to be part of that uh, if it was necessary. But, I, you know, uh, I'd like to sit there and assume that email uh, security is a large enough problem that from that would that once discussion of it being formed, I think it would attract lots of uh, very influential uh, IETF uh, contributors that I know of who've already discussed uh, this topic. 
Excellent. So that leads to my second question. Uh, Stephen Farrell has typed in, uh, to Jabber about like five times or something like that, asking about uh, major mail carrier uh, interest, uh, participation, deployment, things like that. I think that you are making a pretty compelling case that uh, if they're not interested, they ought to be. Um, and But I, I did want to go ahead and make sure that that thought made it into the notes. Um, if, even if the answer is yes, it seemed like that was worth recording. Thank you. And for the record, there is discussions ongoing with uh, some major carriers. Um, I would sit there and say that some of our customers are uh, mid-level uh, carriers that are already uh, really excited about it. And I've had a lot of people that are looking at the enterprise space that are also quite excited about this. Have DKG next in Hi there. Uh, I I appreciate the um, the simplicity of the proposal, but I it really does feel like it is not a um, the way that we would design a security uh, mechanism today. Um, I agree that we do need to be thinking about uh, the impact of this stuff um, on on the email ecosystem. Um, and I think if we're going to design something that offers like a two-factor authentication that mail user agents could implement, um, we can do better than this today. So I, I, I would be happy for us to have a discussion about this um, and to have a working group that focuses specifically on improving authentication in email between clients and servers. Um, I would not think that this is the right draft. I just reminded we got about five minutes on the clock for this. That's also the end of the queue. So if anyone else has comments to put in the queue, please do so now. Or tell me if I forgot you. I've got some people. Okay. Uh, we've got uh, Murray. Quick question. Is there anything written down by any of the people who have implemented this about how successful it's been or what the performance impact has been like or any kind of anecdotes at all? Well, I, definitely there is a few anecdotes that could be shared, I guess, but that's why we're looking for a working group or some proper vehicle so that we can get all these people into the same conversation to discuss these things. Why does a working group need to come first? Sorry, but if is there if anybody has a suggestion how I could share more of that information, uh, by all means. Uh, but it would be nice to see some steps moving forward and a formal mechanism uh, to do all the sharing. And Richard, hey, I was just going to fast forward us to the dispatch questions um, since you know, we were getting to the end of the queue. Um, you know, the, the usual question for this group is, you know, should we form a group or how should we direct this? Um, I, I'm not hearing uh, energy to, to form a group at this point. I think at the very least, we would need to see a charter that puts some more, a little bit more precision on what the scope would be. So, Rich, uh, thank you. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, let's hear from Seth. I, I, I think what is interesting is where can we add two factor and i think that might be in and of itself interesting uh, of doing some ideation around it, what a charter could look like for for, for where that we can add that i just want to point out the obvious like from everything i've heard here it sounds like what whether people would be in favor of this or not depends highly on what the charter actually said so we've already heard that from a couple of people i think you know, that's where I land as well. I need to see a charter to have any clue whether it was supported or not. Thanks, Fluffy. And the chairs are putting their heads together and that's sort of thinking as well at this point. Uh, that was Cullen, right? Okay, then Pete. So, and this is a question for the chairs, I think. Uh, is it appropriate in dispatch for him to post a couple of messages on here's sort of a mushy, charter that I'd like to work on and and some ideas about what the problem statement is 
And here are some comments by folks who have implemented this uh, to let you know what's going on, or does he need a new mailing list first? This is Ben. I would respond saying, I think that's reasonably appropriate dispatch unless it, depending on how far we go with it, it may eventually need to move. However, I'll also note that we have an area director next in queue, so maybe he'll comment on that. Maybe he will. This is Barry. Um, yes, I, I, I think a, a bit more discussion of this on dispatch would be fine. I think if we go more than a little bit, we should have another mailing list. But uh, what I'm seeing is a lot of support for talking about two factor authentication for email. And I think a charter that's focused around that would be great. And I would encourage a few people to get together and start putting such a charter together. And Michael, I suggest uh, it would be good for you to join them. I just wanted to uh, say that whatever we do here, it would be interesting to make sure it works well with JMAP as well. Um, and we just had a TX auth boff just before this, which was talking about something like OAuth, but doesn't necessarily need to have a web browser. Um, it seems like that might be a place that's already working on authentication. Uh, maybe we should join with them. I'd like to sit there and sort of disagree on that one just at that point. Uh, I don't believe I was looking. I sat in on that as well. And I believe that uh, that is a very targeted thing to con to mix these two things. I think they're quite unrelated. So, Michael, I already had you in queue next. Was that your comment or do you have another comment? The last comment. Uh, sorry, I I think uh, Barry's comment of mailing list. Uh, I, I think might be an idea because one of the things that I'm concerned about is the people that are actually involved in email may not actually be part of this dispatch uh, mailing list or may not be uh, having an opportunity to have a voice. And I think that even a mailing list on this topic might be an excellent first step so or, or early step so that we can engage all of the different partners, players, implementers who are using it or trying to use it uh, could all have a voice. Um, AD interrupt. The, um, this is Barry. Uh, the email people in the IETF are very much part of this, uh, the dispatch group. Uh, if you're looking at bringing in other email people that are not regular IETF participants, we would like to see that. And an, uh, a separate mailing list would be a great place to have that happen. Then I have uh, Benjamin. Uh, right, just a quick point. The TX auth buff was mentioned in the context of authentication, but TX auth is focusing on authorization. And the intent is that the authentication will be done by some other existing protocol. All right, we're going to have to cut the queues with that. We've got Murray again. Just real quick, and it, it, was this discussed already in IETF SMTP or at least introduced there? originally discussed there and they they said because it involved IMAP it really wasn't the right place but several members of the SMTP group suggested first art and then art of course just, uh, suggested it goes through dispatch okay thanks okay I am in queue next and I've been hearing some comments about needing to uh, refine a potential charter that sort of thing uh, for some a potential working group is there anyone in this room that wants to stand up and think this needs to go to a buff? I'm not saying that, I'm asking the question. And the uh, quick working group is in queue next. Yeah, sorry, one, one identity for my client, I guess. Uh, Mark Nottingham, uh, yeah, I, I think it should go to a buff. I don't see any reason to fast track this and, and the problem seems to still need a lot of definition. Uh, and the proposed solutions need to be enumerated. So I, I think a buff is appropriate for this. Then I think I have Ecker. 
Becker left the queue. Nothing already covered? I'm not sure. Pizza. Yeah, um, I think a buff is appropriate, but let's not let that stop uh, Michael and others from working on some sort of charter statement before that happens, because we will tend to push things out and the buff shouldn't be the first time we see uh, a, you know, sort of a collection of what the problem statement is. So let, let's do the problem statement and then think about when we set up a buff, in my opinion. And uh, then I have Barry who says after any other, so I don't see anyone jumping in front of Barry. Nor do I. Um, yeah, basically what Pete said, I think the right thing to do is, uh, I guess the right thing to do now is somebody make a um, non, non working group mailing list request to me and I will create it. And discussion can go on there for uh, what I would like to see is people starting to look at, at what work might be chartered and some kind of draft charter proposal, which can then go into a buff at, at 108. Um, presuming that it's not sufficiently agreed upon before then that we just go ahead and charter it. I've got, uh, I think I've got Braun in queue, and then I think unless anyone's really excited, we're going to go ahead and close the queue. Barry, are there any existing mailing lists that should be reanimated rather than creating yet another mailing list? This seems to be different enough that I think it needs its own. So that's that's my thought. If you have some ideas of mailing lists that should be repurposed, let me know. Great. So I'll take a look, but I think it's fine. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Ben. So I think um, as we sort of talked about at the top, it's going to be hard to summarize things based on um, you know, based on this phone conversation and not knowing exactly who in the room uh, is getting a chance to speak. So we'll um, we'll create a summary and send it to the list with the distillation of, you know, how we understood our next action, um, as well as forming this mailing list. And we can kind of go from there, but it does seem like the next steps are gonna be um, drafting a potential charter and determining, you know, what the best uh, forum for that charter would would be and how people feel about it. Because I think it's clear we need to understand some of the details to understand um, yeah, what the scope of the working group would be. At least some folks want to see that. Okay, with that being said, and thank you for the meaningful discussion. And we are actually, you know, because we, um, we agenda bashed here, we're actually basically on time. So, so that's going well. Um, we're going to talk uh, transition here into the, um, the art area meeting portion of our program. So dispatch is concluding, art is beginning. Um, and, um, I think we'll jump right into the UUID presentation. So um, do we have Brad available? Can you hear me? Yeah, you sound good. So just say next slide when you need next slide. Okay, great, thanks. Okay, good. So uh, just kind of summarize here. So um, the goal, as you can see from the slide, uh, we're trying to create, or at least it's the, the idea here is to create a UUID version that works well as a database key. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so why is it important? Where, where is this coming from? Um, there are a lot of database systems right now that use UUIDs as you know primary keys and other keys one way or another. Um, it's existing and deployed, and you know you got examples of that: MySQL, Postgres, Cassandra, Mongo. They all have some some level of they are using UUIDs in one way or another, um, you know, as, as keys. And um, they work fairly well. There's, they're not, um, there are a lot of things that do well with them, but there's some issues that kind of continually crop up uh, that I've run into, that other people have run into. Um, so yeah, this is to kind of outline that. Um, and the idea would be that we're kind of going on the assumption here that it's easier to make some small incremental changes to UIDs as opposed to coming up with something uh, completely new and different and trying to standardize that. Um, and the other thing is that um, databases, you know, these days, you know, the, the UI specification is from, you know, about 15 years ago. And these days, databases are a lot more distributed. So uh, the old, you know, auto-incrementing primary key thing is less and less workable. And um, so 
we find a lot more systems are saying, okay, good, I need to create a unique identifier and insert it myself instead of having a consensus on what is a unique identifier across a, a large cluster of machines. And so that, that thought process tends to lead to the use of UUID as a, as a key as opposed to um, just other mechanisms. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, okay, so a couple of the specific, the specific, specific issues that we run into when you go and just try to use a UID as a key. Uh, for versions two to five, the, there's an index locality issue, which is essentially boils down to uh, if you insert a bunch of keys into a, into a binary tree, uh, putting them at the end tends to be a lot more efficient because you do not have to touch all the various different pages of the tree. It's a, you know, it's a very specific issue, but it is a recurring issue and that happens in a lot of, uh, you know, that is a practical concern that, that you run into. So uh, having UIDs that are time ordered is one solution to that problem. Um, ver there is a version one UID that is time ordered, um, but it's um, there's some things that are inconvenient about it, and um, we'll go into into more. But the sequence of the bytes makes it so you can't easily sort it. It probably would not be worth fixing if it were just for that one thing. But there's some other issues too. So the the thought process is uh, might as well adjust that at the same time. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so. Um, on version one UID, so those have a timestamp. They are they are time ordered, but then uh, the the specification as it stands right now says, okay, we're going to go and put the uh, the MAC address of the machine into the node field, and um, there's various that that can be an issue. It can be a security issue, and um, it also potentially, arguably, could be a uniqueness issue depending on. Uh, it's it's open for debate because um, more and more and more machines are virtual these days and all that stuff. But uh, and we can there can be more discussion on that if that part is in question. But that's the part of a version one UUID that makes it a deal breaker is this thing that the spec says use a MAC address for the last you know the last um, whatever it is last six bytes of that of that uh, value. And another issue that comes up is text format. UUIDs are very long. You write them out as hex with dashes like that. And uh, that's kind of just impractical for a lot of modern applications if we're gonna go, and if we are gonna go and do an improvement to UIDs, it would be great to see uh, a text format that is more generally useful. And uh, so I've, in, in the draft that, that was put together on it, it's got a, a base 62 and a base 64 uh, form. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so I realize this is a bit dense. I'll just kind of cover the highlights, but um, the, uh, yeah, so uh, on uniqueness, right now, again, the, the specification, what ends up happening is the specification says either use the MAC address or there's several different mechanisms for hashing. And really, those are the source of the uniqueness, right? That's, that's what ends up actually physically happening. And um, in, in the situation where we're saying, okay, good, we're gonna implement UUIDs as a key in a database, the reality is, Although I get the name is universally unique, in reality, it's only as unique as the input. So for the purpose of a database cluster, you actually only need, uh, you need it as unique as you need it to be for that application. And right now, per the specification, if you put something else in that node field, that's technically wrong. So um, the idea, it's, it's just, just an observation, it's a point of discussion, but right now the detail, the, um, there's a lot of detail in the specification that says you need to generate it exactly this way when you use the MAC address here and do all the stuff and, and it implies if you don't do that, then what you have is wrong. However, in, in reality, you make a UUID, you can use it in lots of places, and as long as it physically uh, fits some basic binary requirements, it will function properly. So, that, that's just a point of, of um, discussion about what do we consider uh, you can, unique enough for which application and how strict should we be about what you use for uniqueness. Um, I think that's fine. Uh, next slide, please. Um, yeah, okay, and this is, this is a, a little more detail. I think we can, uh, yeah, we can skip that one. I pretty much covered it. Next slide, please. Um, okay, good. So the, here's the, the goal of the draft as it's been put together. Um, okay, maintain as much compatibility as possible. Um, so there were some other things when I was first looking into this and, and in discussions with various people was like, okay, well, should we, uh, you know, maybe 
and you can have variable lengths. I mean, they shouldn't be 128 bit. You know, those those are interesting ideas, but in reality, if we change that, we're changing too much. That's an opinion, but that's kind of um, in some of the discussion. That's also where that went. If we want to make UIDs work, it's kind of got to still be a UUID. Again, some assumptions there, but that's the idea um, as it stands now. Uh, there would be the proposal as time order for good index locality. Um, yeah, and this point about figuring out in the specification, what should it say about what is uh, acceptable for uniqueness in different contexts? And is it okay for applications to just decide, hey, this is good enough for my application, it's binarily compatible, is that correct per the spec? Um, and I figure while we're doing all this, if, if this, you know, if this gets standardized eventually, then might as well handle the sorting so that it sorts directly as a raw bunch of bytes. Um, I don't see any value in preserving uh, an additional complication, whatever. Again, it's my opinion, but that's um, that's a, a piece of information there. And then um, also on the text format. So can we can we get something that's more um, more useful in, for other for applications in general? Something you can put in a URL, something you can have typed in by a human that doesn't need as as much length to it. Uh, that sort of stuff. Uh, next slide, please. Good, and I think this was just more detail on those things. Yeah, there was some. This is basically a breakdown of the bits of the, you know, what exactly we're talking about. Um, I think we can skip that. I think we're. I think that's the. Those are the the core ideas and concepts. And um, the goal and the the you know from my perspective, what we'll be trying to achieve at this moment in time is just to figure out where uh, the discussion would go on this. I realize there's a lot of things that could be argued about this. Uh, um, there's been various discussion uh, previously, but the, the the core idea is people are using UUIDs now. We could do a better job. They're using it for databases, I mean, and um, we could do a better job of you know improving that so that it works well for that scenario. And um, these are some of the specific points that that go into that. And I would like to just just nail down where um, where could that be discussed so that each of these things could be hashed out. That's um, pretty much what, what I have. Um, have uh, Richard Phelps in queue. Thanks. 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 And whoever is not Richard, by sorting. By sorting. Okay. okay, let's see where I go. What do you mean by sorting? Is it just comparing for uniqueness or is it some kind of sorting criteria? And why is it important? Uh, so, so the idea would be um, if you're inserting it into a, as a, if you have it as a database key, then it's sequence in whatever index that is. So, you know, if you're from a database perspective, if you're doing a select, what order does it, uh, is it returned in? Um, and just defining, you know, what is what is the exact for each ID generated, which one always occurs before, or after, or is equivalent to uh, to another value. And then I have Richard Barnes. But just a clarify. So you mean people will do order by UUID? Yeah. Glad you may need to mute when other people are talking. I, I am muted. Uh, I mean, I, I will mute now. So you mean so people will do order by UUID? Okay, so it's not Brad. Someone is not muted who needs to be. Rich, Rich is generating his own feedback. Yes. Let's try again. So you mean people will order by UUID in their queries? Yeah, so to just to give a quick specific example, if I have a, you know, a database table and it is uh, users and I have a primary key of the ID called, you know, the, the unique user ID for that database table, then I would, the type of that ID could be a UUID, and that is a, that is a practical example that you know gets done. 
and um, there that some people have done. And so when I select those users and I say order by the user ID, uh, there needs to be a well-defined sequence that those come back in. And so, and just having an exact definition of which ID is before or after other ones. Okay. I'm skeptical, but okay. Got Richard Barnes next. Uh, hey, the question I want to ask here is, is why we need a, a specification here, right? Like RFC is defined basically interface specifications between these things. And it seems like what you, the use cases you've been describing so far are uh, basically internal to a database. Um, so it's not clear to me why you would need something, you need a, a specification for this, you know, where you would have, you know, interventor, inter intervendor interoperability or something and, and need a specification to negotiate that as opposed to just databases making good decisions. Uh, so to answer that, um, there is some, you know, any anytime you have a, you know, a column in the database, it's going to end up getting read, uh, you know, by some piece of code. Now, agreed, there is definitely a certain amount of like, it's going to be internal to the database. However, um, that that value is going to need to get transmitted and uh, potentially will end up all the way in something like a, a URL in a browser. So that's where some of these other other ideas come from of the, uh, the text format and so forth. Um, so, yeah, I understand it's debatable that whether or not that should or shouldn't be part of the specification. But uh, yeah, those are that's some of this. A UID does end up being transmitted to other parts of the system. And I um, generally I agree with the idea that we don't want too much detail uh, in whatever specification because it tends to um, some of the detail that's in the existing spec says you need to do all these things to make a valid UUID. I'm, I'm kind of paraphrasing, but it, that's kind of the idea you get when you when you read these things, and then some of that detail is not necessary to just communicate in a, a UID that's been created to other parts of the system. But other things are you have to have at a certain length. You have to um, if you put the version ID in the wrong place, then you know uh, nobody will be able to figure out which type it is. So there are certain aspects of the spec which are necessary when you communicate that UID from the database to whatever software is using it, and potentially all the way out to a user. Next. Howdy, Eric Squirrelly here. Um, I mean, this seems like a fine technical design, but the problem is, if I understand your specification, it doesn't actually guarantee uniqueness because, um, and, and, and as you say, you suggest it's, it's locally unique rather than globally unique. So, I mean, I think it'd be fine to have a specification called like non universally unique identifiers, which happen to be 100, 128 bits, and I guess could have six as the first, as the first number, but, um, uh, it seems like when we want when people reach for UUIDs, you want them to actually have uniqueness properties, and so having this be called UUID seems like not particularly amazing. I share that concern. I I do understand, and that uh, that's one of the things to to be discussed. I absolutely agree. I, I would the only thing I would like to add is that MAC addresses are are the source of the quote unquote universal unique you know. Um, identifier, so the fact that making it universally. But in reality, it's as unique as your MAC address is. So I just, I feel like it, it's an important um, distinction to make. And however it gets worked out in the spec, um, I think that should just be presented clearly as these are the un uniqueness guarantees based on the input. Uh, but yeah, if that if the determination is we should call it something else, then that I would have no problem with that. It would make sense to me too. C certainly if your thesis is we should discourage the MAC-based thing, I'm not gonna argue with that. <laughs> Cool, makes sense. That's currently the end of the queue. Great. Brad, thank you for bringing that to us. Um, it's a very interesting discussion. Um, before I move on to the uh, the next draft, which is going to be Mark's uh, HTTP link header draft, um, I plowed right through the transition from the dispatch uh, to the art area section of our meeting. You. If you could see me, I'm waving my hands now. Um, still a little bit unaccustomed to doing two meetings within one meeting and respecting those boundaries. Um, so bear with me. Um, one of the things we wanted to talk about um, in art area are the, um, 
There we go. Um, are some of the boffs coming up? What just happened there? That is really poor, huh? <laughs> Let's go to my email box. Oh, nothing could possibly go wrong here. All right. Um, okay. Uh, some of the meetings of interest, including other boffs that are happening this week. Can you make sure um, your, your microphones are muted? I hear myself in the background, some feedback. Um, does anyone want to uh, step forward and do promotion on some of these? We were just going to, um, you know, kind of put up the slide uh, for people to see what was going on rather than uh, asking for volunteers just due to the format. But if someone has something they want to draw particular attention to, for instance, I will highlight RIPT, which is happening on Thursday, uh, which uh, is an outcome of dispatch in IETF 106. So, uh, Patrick, in the Due to our format and to get through quickly, I think maybe uh, the chair should just talk to these real quick and then uh, if anyone wants to stand up and say more, they can. Sure. Why don't you take the lead here? I walked right into that, didn't I? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, I was busy getting ready to make that comment, not listening to what you were saying. So, I'll just jump in. Uh, well, there was a TX auth earlier today. I didn't put this on this list because it's, it's already happened and I didn't figure anyone could go back in time for it. Who hadn't already seen it uh, but for some new working groups coming up we've got the adaptive dns discovery that's kind of a follow-on to the work from doe that's coming up on tuesday on wednesday we have web packaging and that is listed as a boff but it's a work group information so it's kind of in between uh, then we have the new gen dispatch uh, group coming up on uh, wednesday also where you get to have these kinds of conversations about process things in the IETF in general. And there's a comment in the chat that says we got the time there wrong. It's at 2140, so. Uh, okay. And uh, I did, you can tell I did the slide because I screwed up a bunch of stuff this time. Uh, Friday, uh, we have security dispatch, which is a similar thing for security. And then on uh, Friday, we also have the new uh, working group web trends. Uh, we have a exciting related boff ripped on uh, uh, Thursday, which is kind of the, okay, let's take all this real time stuff and make it web friendly. So I expect that to be a ripped in good time. Mm -hmm. good and time. we largely talked about that in dispatch previously, right? Yes. And then other boffs, I'm not gonna go through them all, uh, but obviously this week, everything is typically a boff or a new working group. So, uh, should not be many conflicts for these boss. We've got, we had TX alt, we have mask coming up, privacy pass and raw. Great. And I see, uh, uh, looks like he is jumped in queue. Uh, only if you want me to mention uh, what's going on in Gen Dispatch. Please do. Uh, there's only two items on the agenda, but they are both interesting. One is a proposal to do something about the updates tag at the top of RFCs to make them more useful. And the other is a follow-on uh, that has to do with, the in part, the eligibility of folks to be on nomcoms and other such things if they are remote participants, which took on new excitement because, of course, everybody being remote this time means that you might not meet the... Uh, the qualifications to be on the nomcom like you would have in the past. So those are the two discussions that are up. Thank you. And chairs, would you like a sec dispatch input as well? Go for it. So we've got four things on the agenda, uh, two of which have HTTP connections, um, one of which is looking to propagate client certs uh, through client cert information through HTTP, um, say from a reverse proxy or a TLS terminator. And the other's looking at adding a, a SASL as, a, as an authentication option in HTTP. So uh, there's also a couple other um, you know token-like things um, and some uh, discussion of attack defense um, might be interesting to folks in the app space. So uh, we have one more in queue, but first I'm going to comment that it's been said in the uh, Jabber room that pretty much all of these times are wrong. So ignore the times, look it up yourself. And then uh, Stuart Card uh, had a comment on drip facing similar issues as you do IDv6, so that may be back a bit. 
I'll let Stuart make his couple comment. Yeah. Um, Stuart. Not. Okay, good. Yeah, Stu here, if you're reading me. Yep, you sound good. Okay. I, I just wanted to mention that the um, UUID V6 um, putative uh, design approach uh, is facing some of the same issues that we're facing in the drone remote identification protocol, new working group that's going to have its first meeting uh, Wednesday night using the proposed HIP hierarchical host identity tag. Thank you for the FYI. A um, couple of bookkeeping items. Uh, blue sheets, if you're not signed the blue sheets, if uh, we have 150 people on this conference call, which would be, I think, a great turnout for an in-person dispatch meeting. So thank you everyone for giving us your time, no matter what time it is in your part of the world. Uh, but make sure you sign the blue sheet. It's on the ether pad, which you can find linked off of the agenda or the top of the WebEx chat. Okay. Uh, Mark, are you ready to give us uh, five minutes on the HP link header? But it's not the link header. Oh, that's true. Link hints. You didn't provide slides, so we all just have to guess. Could you? Well, I did provide a topic though. Uh, could you get the draft up by any chance? Draft Nottingham HTTP link hints. I'll work on that. Yeah. So um, this draft is. Uh, a thought we had a while back, we, we, we observed that uh, people sometimes need to know about a link, more about a link before they follow it. And we saw a lot of, of reinvention of uh, attributes and links to, to, to communicate that. So things like what methods are allowable or what representation types there are and so forth. And so forth. Uh, could you get me? Hi. Thank you. Um, so, uh, we came up with a, a, a fairly simple vocabulary of what we call link hints. In other words, things you can decorate links with that, uh, uh allow you to describe what aspects of the resource that you're about to interact with. And these are all very HTTP specific. So they're about, you know, things you could learn by interacting with a resource using the protocol. But they're they're instead hints that you can discover ahead of time. And I actually I think presented this uh, in the art area meeting probably in 2013. Uh, it's been around for a long time, and there was some polite interest back then. Uh, and then it just kind of sat out there. I wasn't quite sure what to do with it. Um, I brought it up again because I've had a, a fairly persistent set of folks in the background saying. This would be useful, especially for doing things like describing HTTP APIs. Um, it's it's kind of a low level primitive that you can compose in a, in a in, into different description languages, for example. Um, but I'm not sure what to do with it. Um, I don't have a tremendous amount of time to put into it. Are you still there? Mark muted. Unmute. Everyone was muted. Okay. Um, so I brought it to dispatch. Uh, where, where did you last leave me? What was I talking about? Uh, you had spoken about the last time you brought it to dispatch. Okay, good. So uh, since we, we last talked about it, and we got a, a certain amount of interest there. Uh, I've, I've had a persistent kind of low level, you know, group of folks who come along and say, this would be useful. Why isn't it standardized yet? Um, I don't have a tremendous amount of energy to put or time to put into it, but it does seem like it would help some folks if it were standardized. So I'm looking for feedback or advice about what to do next. I could see taking it to the HTTP working group, but it's not really, uh, uh, HTTP in that it's about HTTP, but it's not in the protocol itself necessarily, although it could be used in the link header. Um, I could see just doing it as an independent stream, but perhaps folks want more from that. I could see um, doing it as a, a AD sponsored. I could also see an argument that maybe it would be interesting to spin up a small working group to work on HTTP API related specifications. I think there's a bit of pent up demand for that in that community. 
Um, and and if, if that were the case, I think that there'd be a lot more work that needed to do to happen first. But I just wanted to get some, some feedback from folks about what, where they think this should go, if anywhere. Are you ready for that feedback now, Mark? I, I am sitting down. Okay, we have uh, Seth first in queue. Hi, Mark. Um, something like this is actually a hot topic at MOG right now. It's one of the, the key things some of the major mailbox providers, some of the major senders are trying to do is describe what's in a URL payload uh, so that the, the link doesn't actually need to be opened and scanned. Uh, and so MOG might be a, a very relevant place to have this conversation and bring some of the, the industry feedback then back to a future IETF meeting or even back to dispatch, but this is this is not a hmm, who's interested in this. Like this was this was the conversation actually um, about four weeks ago in San Francisco, and so I'd love to sort of connect you and start to facilitate that conversation if that's a venue you're interested in discussing this in. Um, that that's really interesting, actually. Thank you. Um, I. I will say that I'm a little cautious here in that uh, this is just a vocabulary to adorn links with uh, without specifying how to turn, uh, how to do so. Um, and that's context specific. There is a lot of water under that particular bridge and, and a fair amount of pain as well. Pain, painful water, I guess. Um, in that uh, web services try to do those endpoint references, all the different HTTP description languages have tried to do with link description. It's, um, it's a minefield. But yeah, that, that does sound like a really interesting discussion. So let me, let me reframe it then. Like what we have at MOG is a set of very concrete use cases where there is specific abuse that doing something like this could solve. And so it may not be the whole answer, but I think it avoids some of those minefields because it's, it's very concrete, the problems that are being addressed. Um, but, but again, at, at MOG, we don't necessarily know the proper solution that actually gonna work at scale for everyone. So this would be, completely exploratory, but we would absolutely welcome that conversation. Okay, cool. Thanks. And then, uh, well, Richard made a comment pointing you to a link. I'll let you look at that yourself. And then Harold. So, my name got mentioned. Um, I don't understand the security model of this. In some ways, it reminds me of uh, of uh, bundles where you have uh, pieces that are sh shipped together with the same authentication and authorization. But uh, are, we, are we saying that that I am going to tell you what you uh, what you would uh, normally look up at this other place, and if you believe me, I'm I, I found seven seven ways to fool you. Or is it supposed that we only believe hints that come from the same source as the resource that is hinted at? Uh, more the latter, but it, it's not content. It's it's a very restricted vocabulary of what are the ways, what are the things you could learn from interacting this, from this resource to inform your future behaviors, um, knowing that actually interacting with the resource gives you authoritative. Then, uh, thank you. I, did, I just I was just going to say I, I know Mark was doing a good job of listing off all the possible routes out of dispatch, and so one of them was AD sponsored, which seemed to me like a really bad fit for something with that he has low uh, energy for. Uh, so I was just wanted to mention that. My experience with any, any sponsored drafts was not positive. Well, it depends, I think. If there's a lot of feedback, it, it would be bad. And Richard Barnes. So, Mark, I'll expand a bit on the link I pasted in. The, the, the idea I was trying to convey there is there's a few of these like specification languages out there for saying, like, here's the REST API that exists on this server. Um, with specifying kind of a bunch of similar details to what, what are in this document. Um, I just wonder if you had thoughts on like how this doc would relate to, you know, those things. Is it better in some way um, or worth doing here, more worth doing here for some reason? 
So, so this is actually not competing with those languages. Um, I have another document that, that some would think does, but others convinced me doesn't. That's a different discussion. Um, this is, is more like a vocabulary that they can use. And I think some of the folks who are interested actually intend to use it in that fashion. Um, so it's it's a way you can decorate your links to well understood information about how to interact with those resources uh, into those description languages, rather than being a description language itself. And then Robert, Mark, um, is there a easy place for you to point to to read a little bit about the painful water that's gone into the bridge already? Got a really simple question, and and I don't know that digging in the answers a, a worthwhile thing to do on this call. But if you can aim to where some discussion around it might have been, it seems to me that with this kind of adornment, you could get links that would go into the wild that would semantically hint that puts don't work here. And then when puts work here later, those links are already in the wild and they can't be changed and automated things are probably going to refuse to do those puts without any opportunity for a human to to intervene and say, hey, you know, your hints are wrong, go try anyhow. Yes. Where, um, yeah, so, so the, this, the discussion, uh, unfortunately, is shotgunned across probably a decade and a half of work in both web services and HTTP uh, APIs. Um, I can't point to any one resource, but I'm happy to discuss stuff offline with you if you want. Um, and regarding what you just said, yes, absolutely, that is a risk. Um, it's not, the people who want to use these aren't really looking at doing things where I'm talking about your resources, for example. It's more about when I'm talking about my own resources. It's currently the end of the queue. Anyone else? Thanks, Mark. So we have uh, one thing left on the agenda. Uh, uh, sorry. Go, no, go ahead. I asked for it to be dispatched, and then it was put in the art area, which I know isn't dispatch, but. Uh, yeah, I didn't ask the dispatch least... questions because we had it in art area. Yeah. <laughs> so, apologies, that was my mistake. I didn't realize it was intended for dispatch, but I guess that was the original question, wasn't it? Yes. Well, let's pretend we're still in dispatch. And if we were still in dispatch, Barry, what would, people, key what would be the key question to consider? What do people think we should do? That's right. I see Robert's in the queue. Robert, back in the queue? No, no, that's my old, that's my old plus queue. I'm done. Sorry. Mark, in a perfect world, what would you want with the draft? That's a great question. Um, and, and people can line up and tell you why you're wrong. Good. Oh, I, I, welcome to the IDF. Um, I, I, I have to say, I was, I was thinking in the shower this morning, uh, it would be interesting to, to discuss the possibility of a working group to work on HTTP API related specifications. Um, I, I think it could go horribly wrong, but it also might improve the world. But I think that's a much longer term discussion. In, in the meantime, this is a fairly compact, relatively straightforward thing. Um, I, I'm not sure if it needs a working group or not. Is it worth, this is Barry, is it worth having this be a seed for a working group, a seed that sprouts quickly, but allows a space for other related discussions? That would be interesting, yeah. I don't see anyone else in queue. Now that, uh, I'll put myself in queue from the the floor. I mean, it sounds sort of like it's a HTTP ecosystem or an HTTP, not really an ops group, but you know, meta HTTP suggestion. Um, maybe we should expand on that idea, right? And and 
discuss what a charter for that might look like and put that forward and see if that is a dispatchy item or not. Because I, I think I think this link declaration, you know, the HP BIS could process it if they wanted to, and I don't think I'd want, you know, really any other machinery around it just due to weight if it were going to be the only thing. But I, I think you've got a point that it won't be the only thing. Yeah. And and it's not like it can't wait a little while. Um, it's waited for quite a while now. I also hesitate to take it to HTTP BIS, I think, because that community is mostly HTTP implementers, and this is a slightly different community, although there is some crossover. I'm in queue next, and and I will comment that. So when you sent this originally, you were hoping we could get this done on the mailing list, and obviously that didn't happen. I uh, wonder now that you've had a chance to talk about it and people have a chance to think about it. If our next step is not to turn around and re-ask some of the dispatch questions on the mailing list from the chairs, and and sometime like really shortly after this meeting, and see where conversation goes there. Or, or do Patrick or ADs, does anyone think we've actually learned enough here to make any dispatch decisions? No, I think we're talking about it in a slightly different flavor here at the end of this conversation than just the draft. And that's probably an idea that just needs to be explored. But that's some progress. Uh, so can I suggest, um, why don't I go off and explore the idea of what a charter for that other working group might look like and try and engage with the folks I know who work on HTTP APIs a lot to see if we can get some amount of motion behind that. And if we can, then we can bring that back and discuss it in what might exactly. be a great. Exactly yeah. what I was going to suggest. Great. And, but the only proviso I'd put is, is that, that if that doesn't happen for some reason, I'll come back with this document, maybe one other one and say, hey, what should we do? We can have a hard to hard discussion about, you know, how this intersects with things that use HTTP as well, right? Exactly. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. Well, our session goes until 10 after the hour, which is about um, 30 minutes from now. So we've got room for our time as time allows item. Um, Maxime, are you going to present these slides? Sure. Okay. Um, this One is... thing from Ben, Maxime, I had given you guidance that we might be really tight on time. Looks like we're not. So go for it. The one thing I would, you know, um, we will have a hard stop in 28 minutes. So uh, I would encourage you to leave a lot of time for discussion. Please carry on and just okay. tell me when you need a new slide. Okay, thanks. So, hi everyone. My name is Maxim Sharabaika. I present the SRT Research and Development Team at High Vision. On behalf of High Vision at SK Telecom, I am introducing the Secure Reliable Transport Protocol. Uh, so, due to time limitations, I was asked to only share the motivation and key features of the protocol so that we can discuss which track to go and uh, continue more technical discussions on the dedicated working group. Uh, so, next slide, please. Briefly, SRT is a protocol built on top of UDP. It is content agnostic. It provides bidirectional data transmission with automatic repeat requests, forward error correction, and bonded connections. It also supports three multiplexing so that several connections can be established over a single UDP socket. Uh, and of course, uh, encryption. The major purpose and use case of SRT is low latency live video contribution and distribution over unreliable networks. Next slide, please. SRT was created and first used in 2013. In 2017, SRT was made open source and free for public usage. At the moment, SRT is an open source library based uh, protocol that has been widely adopted and has become a de facto industry standard for live contribution and distribution. Companies using SRT are joining the SRT Alliance that currently counts more than 350 members. Only last year, more than 100 new companies have joined the SRT Alliance. Also, last year, SRT received the Technical Emmy Award. All these are good indicators that SRT is a highly demanded solution of a still topical problem of live contribution and distribution. SRT is very flexible, multi-purpose, content agnostic. Its open source implementation is very easy to use because it provides APIs similar to UDP and TCP socket APIs. And so the library is backward compatible so that the latest version still supports previous versions of the library. Next slide, please. 
up until today, CERT is an implementation driven protocol. Uh, but it is about time to provide an official specification of the protocol so that everyone can use it to write an independent implementation and be sure to be compliant with others. That is one of the requests we get from our community and one of the reasons for CERT to be presented to IATF. Another motivation is to become a part of a great IATF community to get valuable feedback and experience and continue improving uh, the protocol. Uh, next slide, please. So to give you a quick idea uh, about the protocol, uh, SRT offers several operation modes, message mode, live mode, and buffer mode. Message mode can be used to reliably transmit messages that span over several packets. Live mode is a subset of message mode with additional features to enable real-time live stream transmission with a constant end-to-end -end latency and possibility to drop packets. Uh, so that's a reliable delivery within a certain latency window. And finally, buffer mode is used to open a connection, transmit a single and large piece of data, and close the connection. Next slide. The major purpose and use case of SRT is low latency live video contribution and distribution. Uh, the corresponding operation mode of SRT is called live mode. The live mode provides a fixed end to end latency that includes network transmission latency and a configurable buffering delay of the receiver to recover packet losses. The receiver delivers a packet to an upstream application not earlier than after the specified latency has expired. Next slide. Live mode provides an additional benefit of recovering the timing of the source VBR streaming that can be distorted by network transmission. Uh, this recovery of timing helps decoders and playback devices to add only minimal additional latency for decoding, while the whole management of the end-to-end -end latency is performed by SRT so that application doesn't need to implement and handle it itself. Uh, so next slide, that was the introduction. Thank you very much for attention and I'm ready to answer your questions. Thank you, thank you. Mr. Dawkins, thank you. keep pushing my mute button and it keeps wiggling around. Sorry. Um, thank you for bringing this. Um, the questions that I would be curious about um, would be whether you intend to work on this protocol further or whether you need to, whether what you need to do is pub publish what you've got. Um, and if you need to publish it uh, as an RFC, as a stable reference, does it need to be an ITF uh, standards track protocol? Uh, Colin Perkins had, had a uh, third question that I lost one on. So uh, the third question was, how does this dis differ from uh, other ITF work? But I think the, the my first two questions would tell you how many qu more questions you needed to answer about this. If it needs, you know, if it just needs to be publishing what you've got, that means something. If it needs to be, if it just needs to be publishing what you've got as a standard track document, that means something else. So I would uh, ask you to think about those two questions first. Thanks very much for this question. It's really one of the questions we consider uh, to discuss with ITF. Um, so with SRT, we want, uh, first of all, to uh, specify what we already have uh, so that our community doesn't lose the compliance. And within this domain of what we have, we can potentially increase and add some features, uh, but still uh, remaining the compliance. So, for example, we can add some more encryption techniques, so we can add some other mechanism and so on. So that's one uh, one purpose of our um, of our work. And maybe for this we need informational track. Potentially another purpose that we can go with ITF is to continue improve SRT and to make maybe an improved version. But that's also a topic uh, to discuss. So, so the two things I would say there is uh, we have in the past, I'm even chairing a working group now that's, you know, here's, we're publishing, here are the versions of something that we've already done. 
but we didn't do them at the ITF. Uh, and those will be informational and then uh, we'll publish what we're work, you know, what we're working on now that they want that the people wanted help with. And that that was going to be published in our case as a standard track document. Maybe, you know, maybe, maybe even informational would be okay for you for that too. Um, but you know, some people bring us things where what they really want is ex you know, is a lot of eyes on something and bring it to the ITF for review uh, and then publication after the review is, you know, is what they want. So just asking you to be kind of clear in your mind about what you're hoping happens, uh, you know, with, with this out of the choices that you've got, but you've got a lot of choices. Yeah, this wide review is also a good point and uh, also an experience with other C proposals uh, to to have some kind of uh, cooperation with other stuff like stream identification and so so we are open for communication for the feedback. Okay, thank you. Uh, hey, I was just wondering, um, yeah, since security was in the name, it got my attention on it. Um, so I'm wondering if you could kind of confirm kind of what the security assumptions are around this. Normally with things like TLS or Quick, we assume that the two parties don't have anything in common besides some public data. Um, whereas this looks like on, on a, I haven't dived deeply into the specification, but it looks like there is an assumption here. There's some pre key material pre-configured. Uh, between the endpoints. Um, so th that's kind of one question. The other question I had is it looks, again, from a, a very brief review of the, of the crypto here, like uh, some of the standard things we do in the IETF these days and doing modern protocols, um, like using AEAD uh, al algorithms pretty much everywhere, you're doing forward secrecy might not be here. Um, so I'm wondering, like, if we were going to do some work here, how much flexibility would there be to kind of update those uh, security bits to a more modern foundation? Thanks. Yeah, thank you for another good question. So uh, you're right, at the moment, SRT encryption is based on a shared password uh, that is used with password-based key derivation mechanism. Uh, so it's partially a st standard uh, approach to do it, but still both parties should have a common pre-shared password to establish the reliable connection. But still, SRT uh, provides mechanisms and provides additional uh, field extensions of the handshake to improve this. And if for some use cases you need, for example, TLS handshake, we are also free to consider how it will um, how it will connect with SRT. I think it should it should work as well. Uh, th thanks for clarifying that. Um, given given that you're password oriented, have you looked at things like password authenticated key exchange protocols to layer into this? Probably in uh, in the future, if it makes sense. And sorry, just to continue, repeat the second question here. So I think even within that password-based uh, framework you've got, you could do some th tune some things up, like doing authenticated encryption or uh, adding in, um, you know, per message uh, per per session uh, entropy with uh, the DH exchange, say, um, which have kind of varying levels of impact on the protocol. I'm just wondering how much tolerance there is for changes of that character uh, if we were going to do some work on this in the ITF. Well, as as I can tell right now, I think it's so uh, SRT is very open to this because. Uh, so you have two phases where you need encryption. First is how you negotiate the certain encryption mechanism and algorithm that can be extended for sure with with means of handshakes and second part is how, is how you encrypt the payload so SRT encrypts only the payloads of data packets it doesn't encrypt headers and how you encrypt the payload is again up to so it can be extended eventually so we, we're glad to have some um, proposals here as well With Hi, thanks for the presentation. Um, I guess one thing I didn't quite get from your presentation or the discussion on the mailing list is like what functionality does this have that Quick does not? 
Um, so, I mean, is this just a matter of you have a technology and you don't want to like change everything? Or is there some set of functionality that this has that like makes it substantially better than quick and that could be easily adapted to quick? Yeah, thanks for another good question. Um, so as far as I understand quick, um, it proposes the datagram uh, extension that is being under development right now. And uh, if I understood it correctly, it's more like, um, let's say, a UDP extension. It's UDP with um, encryption and with kind of feedback, if I understood it correctly. What SRT does, it's, it's not something uh, new and unique. Uh, so you can combine several other protocols and build similar pipelines, similar workflow, but SRT provides everything out of the box. The main purpose if is live streaming contribution and distribution, and you have one bi-directional channel that uh, is encrypted, uh, that provides jitter management, latency management, uh, packet reordering management, and so on. And so that if you have an application that needs to work with live streaming, you don't need to bother and to implement it yourself or to collect several protocols and organize an uh, infrastructure for them like several uh, several connections and so on all, all is available out of the box and that's the major purpose of SRT and uh, one of the use cases Yeah, uh, so I'm back again. Um, so Richard Barnes was asking the question about uh, being receptive to or being thinking about um, an updated security uh, framework. Um, and th there's also a question about that from a transport perspective. Um, you know, if you're uh, especially if you know you had as one of your uh, applications rapid file transfer. So, kind of what your story was on congestion avoidance and congestion control and uh, being agile on uh, congestion control mechanisms as we develop new ones and things like that. Um, so, again, you know, it's just a thing to keep in mind. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're actually able to uh, evolve transport protocols now a lot faster than we ever could for 20 years. Uh, so just kind of, kind of where you're think, you know, where you're thinking is about how that might be in it, uh, included here as well. Could you please uh, elaborate a bit on this? Because I didn't uh, catch the idea. So congestion control plus encryption. That was the question, right? So, well, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I was, it may not have been clear. So, um, we've had, so, you know, the 1st thing, you know, you've got a, you, you, you've got a, uh, UDP based protocol. And, uh, so we would ask questions about, uh, how safe that is for use over the open internet. Um, especially if you're talking about, uh, file transfers where, uh, you're not sender limited. You may not be sender limited on how fast you can transmit. Um, so, you know, number one is, is this safe for uh, operation over the open internet? And number two is uh, if you, you know, if it, if it has enough congestion management capability to be safe on the open internet, um, are you going to need to evolve that uh, as we come up with new con congestion control mechanisms? That would have better performance characteristics that you would just want to uh, bring, you know, just bring in. Um, you know, we, we, you know, that's something that, that's something that Quick is doing is, you know, do it working with the, like pluggable ingestion control mechanisms. So for that for that kind of thing. Okay, I see. And thank you for clarification. Yes, that's something that was on my presentation. If um, if uh, Slide 16 can be opened, I would appreciate that. So just to give you an idea, uh, SRT provides certain mechanisms that are very similar to, uh, to quick mechanisms. Okay. SRT sends acknowledgement packets, and these acknowledgement packets um, have additional fields 
from the receiver uh, that estimates, for example, RTT, estimates uh, link capacity and other measurements, uh, receiving speed and so on. So sender gets certain feedback from the receiver on that. And another mechanism and another feedback is negative acknowledgement packets. So when uh, the packets are lost, receiver also sends negative acknowledgement packets and sender knows the amount of losses uh, in this transmission so that any congestion control can utilize this data to implement uh, certain algorithms uh, on top of it. And in SRT, we have two types of congestion control. Uh, one is for live mode, yeah, that's the slide. So one is for live mode uh, and the unique uh, unique feature of live mode is that you have limited source bitrate. So for example, you have a live stream of 10 megabits per second and you can't go above that. Right. Uh, so here you have certain uh, possibilities to control how you do your pacing, how you do retransmissions and so on. So that's one part of SRT that is already uh, used and also based on this acknowledgement feedback and uh, negative acknowledgement feedback. Another part is file transmission and that's again, uh, so BBR, Cubic, uh, all this can be used uh, on top of ARC and NAC packets. So that's completely extensible and very, very flexible. Okay, so you're, you're pl you, are, you are planning on being able to do uh, the con congestion control uh, agility uh, that we're doing on other protocols then. Right. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Next in queue, Cullen Jennings. My question is probably simple, and that is it's around congestion control again. And is that the, is the congestion control that you guys are using today the same one that's specified in the GD, the GG UDP drafts? It's uh, it is based on this uh, congestion control, so it's still uh, um, it's still based on the um, addictive increase and multiplicative decrease uh, mechanism. But it is being adjusted uh, based on our experience with file transfer. But we are still uh, working is, to improve this. Is it documented somewhere? Because I mean, it's a lot more complicated than just additive increase multiple degrees for that, right? I mean, it's, it's sort of like, is there a, like, is it just the GitHub code that's the current documentation for it? Or where would I find out about the congestion control? At the moment, yes, there is some, um, some parts on this in UDT and it's in, in the most part, it's still true, uh, but it's, we have certain improvements uh, that um, are not documented yet and be uh, looking forward to document them. Next is Bernard Aboba. Hi, um, I just had a question as to whether there was ever a desire to implement something like SRT, SRT on the web. Uh, that's a good question. We are completely open for it. I understand that it will need um, support from browsers and all the web technologies we have um, right now in the world. So. Still, yeah, why not? Uh, I guess, well, my question was because um, you're probably not going to get UDP access directly from the web. Um, and kind of a supposed solution for web UDP is quick. So. Um, just sure. you know, want to mm -hmm. understand that you're thinking on that, whether that's why some of the people are asking about quick, I think one of the reasons anyway. Well, that's a good topic for discussion. Uh, to me, why Quick is uh, being good um, for, for this purpose is because a lot of browsers and Chrome engine also already supports this protocol. So here we have, uh, let's say, more a topic of discussion how to, to be included in this uh, engine if we require it. Or another potential road is to go on top of some kind of web sockets and try to do, but I think that would be a bit tougher road. And then Colin Perkins. Uh, hi, uh, a number of people have asked about uh, how this relates to Quick. Uh, I'm gonna ask the, the other uh, question, which is how does this relate to RTP, the real-time transport protocol? 
Uh, we've had a, a lot of work in that space over many, many years in the IETF, and it sounds like there's a lot of similarities. So what, what's different here? Yeah, thanks for the question. Again, uh, CERT is not something that can cannot be found in other protocols, but it's uh, it's a mix of all you need for live streaming. And with R RTP, you have unreliable delivery over UDP. So you have timestamps on the packets, that's okay, but still you don't have the backward track. So for backward track, you use additional link, additional connection like RTCP or RTSP to control uh, this flow. And again, it doesn't provide you all you need. With uh, SRT, you get all that in one bi-directional uh, connection. So you get live stream possibilities. And with, for example, stream multiplexing, you can also get additional features. For example, one of the use cases SRT is used is, is when a video operator on field uh, records the video and live streams it to the to the production center and in the production center a producer might uh, send feedback to this video reporter also on this very um, SRT connection so you can establish on the same UDP socket live streaming connection you can establish on the same UDP socket as a, as a multiplexed stream message interchange and so on so that's the convenience of uh, SRT if that answers your question uh, people have been multiplexing things onto the same socket as RTP for a very long time. Of course, but again, uh, the main purpose is that you get everything uh, out of the box. So, for example, uh, you get you can get live streaming, you can get message uh, interchange and so on. And that's all, like the latency management is managed by SRT. So when you implement an application, you don't... Um, you don't do this logic on your own. Again, as I said, you can you can use RTP, you can use additional protocols to provide this stuff, and it's it's completely okay. It depends on the use case you have. But again, what if you don't want RTP? What if you want MPEG TS right away? With SRT, you can do it. With SRT, you can also put RTP inside of SRT payload. That's completely okay as well. So it, it's just, I think, uh, another way to uh, to operate with this and uh, we appreciate the work with RTP and uh, if we can discuss how we can for example improve and cooperate and mix both uh, together it would be also good for yeah I'm not seeing anything we can't do already but uh, okay So this is Pat McManus. Um, thank you so much for the presentation and the questions it generated. Um, as we consider from a dispatch point of view, um, you know, where this might fit into the IETF universe, I think I want to clarify something that came up on the list. And that was the question of whether this is intended as a, you know, a specification that cannot change because it's deployed in multiple products, um, or if this is um, an area that we want protocol standardization on and intellectual contributions from a working group on, because those would proceed into very different paths. So would this be something the IDF would have changed control over, or would this be sort of a version one, version two thing where that might apply to a second version, but not a first version? So I would say that uh, would be good to have this uh, specified as it is right now and have a potential to extend within this specification. So if we don't change the existing handshakes much, or and we don't change the uh, SRT headers that are currently exist, that would be great because this protocol is already being used. And the part of that, if some additional improvements arise, and I, I think there are some parts that can be improved, we can, um, can start some efforts to um, have a se separate version, additional version of the protocol. Sure. So the usual advice in a situation like that would be that you work with the individual submissions editor um, to try and get a specification published in a non-protocol stream or non-standard stream for that. Um, and then once that's established, we can talk about where the IETF might be able to do work um, for um, you know, extensions and that kind of thing. I mean, that, I don't want to speak for the group, but that would be, I think, the fairly typical advice. 
Okay, thanks. Ben, I just saw a clarification go by on the Jabber stream. We're talking about the uh, independent stream, not just the individual submission. What I believe that uh, uh, Patrick was talking about. Yeah, I yield to that, of course. Okay, so thank you for that. And we are right on the dot by my clock. So I wanna thank everyone, 150 people. Um, our lives have been disrupted, but the IETF carries on. So that's really great. And we'll see you all um, next time. And we hope to see 150 entries in the blue sheet. Yeah, there were over 140. So I'm pretty pleased about that. But if you missed it, now's your chance. Turn yourself in. Honesty is the best policy. <laughs> Make good choices. Thanks, everyone. Goodbye. Mike.